Hello, I'm Katie Grimley. I'm welcoming you from St Joseph's Chapel in Monos, Leicestershire, at the St Brendan's Altar. Um, today I'm going to be reading Field of the Saints by Claire Grimley, my mother. Um, this was sadly unpublished, um, but it's about a fisherman called Brendan. Chapter 1, Preparation. Before any journey, however small, whether to a nearby Blasket Island or to more distant waters, Brendan, a local fisherman, always carefully examined his boat. His salt-scarred his hands gently caress the black skin of his curra as he checks the strength of the wooden ribs beneath and how well the skin is tightening. Like the deep lines on his face, the markings and grooves on his boat recall both the lonely and terrifying nights he has spent on the sea, as well as those mornings as he watched the sun come over Mount Brandon, lifting the mists of the fields below. Checking his boat is a meticulous job, for once he is out on the sea, all there is between Brendan and the mighty ocean is his curra, and it is in this tiny vessel that he puts his trust. Chapter 2 The Wooden Frame There are many ruined oratories scattered across Ireland, similar to this at Kilfountain. It would have been in the prayerful silence inside such oratories that fishermen would have prepared themselves for the journeys they were to undertake. It would have been in such oratories that wives, mothers and children would have said their prayers of safekeeping whilst their men were on the sea. The making of the curra is never an easy task, not even for an experienced sailor like Brendan. It is a trade that few people can learn, as it is mostly done in the head, so to speak. Brendan sat and thought about how he was going to make it, and only when he had thought it all out was he ready to begin. Brendan began to picture the boat he would make. He saw his hands bending hard oak strips into two gunwales and the repetitive knocking as he fastened them with the wooden pins. He imagined shaping the gunwales into the familiar banana shape of the curra. Then he lifted the boat upside down so that it could be built from the bottom up. The cream coloured ash slats were then positioned, forming the ribs and the backbone of the curra. Thinner slats were interleaved along the length of the curra, copying the knotwork engravings he had seen on fine silver flasks and bracelets. Brendan recalled the time when he had crouch, he would crouch under the upturned frame of a vessel, and he had helped his own father wrap. Tighten and knot leather thongs at every section where the ash overlapped, strengthening the hull against the ferociousness of the sea. Brendan smiled as he saw his own dear mother's face when he and his father had returned home, smothered in the foul-smelling, foul sticky wool grease that they used to waterproof their vessel. Brendan remembered all of this and knew that he was ready to build his boat. And he knew that as he built, his father would be at his side, watching and aiding him in his every move. Chapter 3. Tending to the Skin Fitting the skin onto the curra is perhaps the most difficult and time-consuming task of all. Each hide must be overlapped by a couple of inches, and a strong double line of thread is stitched along every joint. No stitch can be too loose, short or long, and it must be the correct spacing from its neighbours. If every stitch is not perfect, it must be mercilessly ripped out. As he worked, Brendan was only slightly aware of the increasing pain in his shoulder, as in one sharp jerk he pulled the thread taut between stitches. Pulling on the thread also dug deep into the soft, fleshy parts of his palms. Blood ran from his hands down the flax and dripped onto the dark hide he was working on. Brendan only slightly noticed. It was this small sacrifice for the curra that was already such an important part of his life. 
But this was slow, hard and tiring work. When Brendan stood up, after hours of work, kneeling on the cold, damp floor, he stretched and in a gush felt the cool air all around him. He looked down at his finished curra, dark and shining in the ebbing sunlight. Tomorrow, Brendan would collect some water from a holy well and carefully pour it into a small glass bottle and store it inside the curra, as he did before every journey. Brendan hoped that tomorrow, God would send him fair weather and a helpful breeze to guide him on his way. Chapter four, hoisting the sails. Early in the morning, whilst the light was still pale and translucent, Brendan and his brother, Padre, in one simultaneous move, lifted the upturned curra, balanced it on their shoulders, steadied their arms, and began the long walk towards Brandon Creek. As they walked, their eyes saw only the stony ground beneath their feet, and the birds from above saw a strange dark object with four legs getting closer to the water's edge. Each man kept in time with the other, and underneath his breath, Brendan muttered the little prayer that his father had taught him. Dear God, be good to me. The sea is so wide and my boat is so small. Brendan lost count of the many times he said it, and when he suddenly, when suddenly they had rounded the sharp left bend and were on the final gentle hill to the creek, Padre shouted, heave, and together they laid the curry on its back onto the grey jetty. It was now quite light and the waves were catching the sun as she began to dance on the water. Brendan had always loved the stillness of the creek. It seemed to show the respectful silence that these beautiful vessels deserved and they slipped quietly into the salt water or as they rested on the grass nearby. Brendan had almost forgotten why he was here and was suddenly aware that Padre was looking at something behind him. Brendan turned and saw his mother running down the lane towards them. Brendan was so shocked, he had to steady himself with a hand on the boat. You didn't think you would leave me without a proper, proper sending off, did you? His mother asked. Brendan remained silent. He watched as his mother sprinkled some holy water over the boat and prayed that God, the sun and the spirit would guard him and watch over him until he had returned. She made the sign of the cross and embraced Brendan, her oldest son. Mother, Brendan gasped, as she helped him into his boat. She pushed some food and wine into his hands, just in case, as she always used to say. He was just about to turn and say something when a large wave came over the jetty and took him and his curra into the creek. As Brendan began to pull up the sail, he shouted, breaking the silence all around, I'll be seeing you soon. As he left the creek, he turned and saw them running up to the top of the cliff. He remembered the last time his mother had waved off a curra from there. A single tear slipped down the crease of his face as he remembered that cold day his father's curra was washed up ashore. His mother had said that that day the sea had taken the finest man in all of Ireland. She had sworn that none of her sons would ever sail on the water again. Brendan prayed that God would be good to him. Chapter five, the journey. The breeze slowly strengthened to a wind and Brendan's sail filled out. Brendan sat back and allowed the boat to cut through the water creeping almost silently across the backs of the gentle waves. When the dingle curra is on the water, it rides high, both ends lifting gently out of the water. Brendan could see for miles around him. The cliffs of the peninsula were still visible and far into the distance were those two precarious skellig rocks, one a home for cormorants and various seabirds, the other a home for monks seeking a desert in the sea. For most of the day, Brendan busied himself with the mundane tasks of a small vessel, and soon the sun sank 
and the sky turned into a sapphire blue and the twinkling of the tiny bright stars hurdled the night. Brendan settled himself down and by candlelight repeated his prayers as he did every night on the land. He closed his eyes and slowly picked a picture of the land his father had told him about formed. He saw clear waters that sparkled and reflected the bright vibrancy of the plants and flowers around. He felt the warmth of the sun rays on his back and the scent of the sweet, indescribable smells was all around. Brendan reached down into one of the pools to cool his face with the water. But the water was not as warm as expected, but freezing cold. <laughs> Brendan awoke with a start. The weather had changed and a storm was fast approaching. A wave had just drenched his boat and in the dark he could hear the wind building up its strength. Brendan quickly began to batten down everything that was free. As he nimbly moved around the boat, he could feel the Curra begin to climb the waves as, as they increased in size. As the waves got bigger, the boat teetered for what seemed in the darkness as ever-increasing lengths of time on the wave's brink. And finally, caught helplessly in the tumbling crest, the boat was swept down and left in the pumping in and out like the sides of the great whale breathing. He could hear the wooden ribs groaning beneath the tightly stretched skin as it was attacked from all sides. Brendan knew he could only trust God and the well-worn traditions he had learnt at his father's side that he used to build the boat. His departing prayer echoed in his head. Dear God, be good to me. The sea is so wide and my boat is so small. And the final chapter, chapter six, the return home. As Brendan saw sight of the land, he began to row, pushing his muscles to their limits so that he could no longer feel his shoulders or forearms and only kept rowing because of the rhythm, rhythm he strictly kept. Although he was near enough to the peninsula to see Brandon Creek, he was still far enough away that a good hour of rowing only brought him close to the creek's entrance. Brendan paused for a moment to get his breath back. His chest rose and sank as he listened to the calls of the gulls. He secretly thought that he was getting too old for this. At 60 years of age, he had already used up most of his seafaring look. Perhaps this would be his last journey his mind flicked back to his childhood days when he had sat at his parents' friend's house and listened quietly to his father retell the same story hundreds of times. The story of when he had found paradise, that mythical land that all Irish folk wanted to go in search of. He could have only been five years old when he decided that he too would go in search. And from then on, he paid close attention to every detail of what his father had said and did. It took some very important to make the young Brendan leave his father's side. And then, when he was still only a young man, his father had died. And there was still so much unlearned and unsaid. And after all these years, he had not found that one desire. That land of paradise was just still out of reach. Perhaps it was time to give up. But surely that would mean giving up on all his father had stood for, all he had taught him. No, it must be something that Brendan wasn't seeing. God's plans were still not clear. Perhaps Brendan should think bigger. There were those who had wanted to come in the past, but Brendan was no leader. How could he ask others to risk all for his own dream? These thoughts had filled his mind as he reached the jetty. Hands pulled him up. Brendan looked up and saw all his friends, their faces straining with the anticipation of hearing Brendan's tales. One of the youngest lads helped him out the curra. Father, he said, did you find it? Was it all that you'd hoped for? Brendan smiled and stroked his head affectionately. No, my son, 
It was yet another simple old Brendan's wild goose chases. Many there let out an involuntary sigh of disappointment. But Brendan asked for the curra to be laid on its belly, to let it dry out, and asked everyone to sit down. Next time, he said, I shall take all who want to journey with me. For I know that before my next birthday, God will show me his blessed isle. But not only to me, but to all who long in the hearts to see it. And with that, Brendan stood up and stretched and thanked God for bringing him back to his dear land and to his even dearer people. <laughs>